In this video I'm going to beat Pokemon Yellow with only a Haunter, playthrough rules are in the description. Now I have already done both Gengar and Ghastly, and both of them are high performers in Pokemon Yellow. Currently Ghastly is the highest ranked first stage Pokemon, and I haven't even really optimized this thing. I did one playthrough with it a long time ago, and then I did a stream with Gym Leader Matt where we both played through the games with Ghastly, but we didn't prepare strategically for that video. We were much more focused on technical considerations. I do think eventually Ghastly will be ranked higher, but for now it is still very good. Gengar on the other hand is obvious exceptional. It is currently one of three Pokemon that I have got a time under 40 minutes with. Now there are only really three things that hold this line back. Number one, they don't have HP, attack, and defense stats to write home about. They are centered around special and speed. The second weakness is their poison typing, because ground type moves hit very hard before the introduction of levitate. And the third weakness is, of course, hypnosis. This is one of the worst sleep inducing moves in generation one, and we are definitely going to feel the pain of it today. By the way, I have actually been feeling the pain of not sleeping in my own real life. My ADHD medication makes me wake up at like the slightest sounds or light, that sort of thing. And that brings me to this video's sponsor, Manta Sleep. They make fantastic sleep masks that are 100% blackout. I wasn't sure that that claim would be true, but after trying it, it is true. You can't see absolutely anything, which is really helpful when light disturbs your sleep. Also, the masks are infinitely adjustable, so you can always get a really good personalized fit. I was very worried that it was going to cause like pressure on my nose or on my eyelids, that sort of thing. But because you can adjust everything, this is just not a problem. Also, they have a whole bunch of different masks. I can't cover them all, but I'm going to mention the Manta Sleep Mask as well as the Manta Weighted Mask. Because uh, weighted stuff is just really nice, like a weighted blanket, that sort of thing. Anyways, I highly recommend it. Another thing about the company that I really like is they have a pro-nap movement. They're trying to push back against hustle culture, and having naps during the middle of the day, much like my cat Churro, seems like the perfect way to do that. However, when you're a human, it can be hard to fall asleep if it's bright outside, so the mask can really help you there. I encourage you to check out their website at mantasleep.com, and you can use my code, SCOTTSTHOUGHTS, to get 10% off your order. Thank you Mantasleep for sponsoring the video, and raising the accuracy of hypnosis so that a few more people can go to sleep. Now, let's get back to the video. Let's start things off by comparing the three species in the Ghastly line. After all, this is going to be my final fully produced yellow version video that includes them. Haunter receives a 15 base stat improvement over all of Ghastly's stats. So it ends up with 45 HP, 50 attack, 45 defense, 115 special, and 95 speed. This gives it an 18.36% chance to crit in Generation 1 because critical hits are determined by the Pokémon's base speed. I know it's kind of weird if you don't play a lot of Generation 1, but that's how it works. Now when Haunter evolves into Gengar, it receives the same base stat improvement, so 15 across the board. So because Haunter's stats are right in the middle, it's uh, fitting for it as it is a mid-stage evolution, I think that it is going to end up ranking somewhere evenly distributed between Ghastly and Gengar. Since I think I can improve Ghastly's results, I wouldn't be surprised if Haunter earns a time at the top of the A tier, or maybe, just maybe at the end of the S tier. And predicting an S tier finish isn't the most outlandish thing that I could do, because most of the Pokémon in the S tier currently have the medium slow growth rate, which is the growth rate that Haunter has. The only current exception to this rule is Hypno. Uh, that thing would be absolutely monstrous if it had a medium slow growth rate. Without a doubt, it would be number one. Okay, so let's go through Haunter's move pool, which unfortunately in Generation 1 is pretty small. It starts with Lick, Confuse Ray, and Nightshade. By the way, Nightshade can hit normal type Pokemon, so that's going to be my answer to them in the early game. After that, through Level Up, it learns Hypnosis at level 29, and then Dream Eater at level 38. And that's it, because the developers felt that uh, it was fine to only include three Ghost-type moves in the game. And yeah, the only one that deals type-based damage is Lick, so that's really frustrating. Through TM and HM, it learns Toxic, Rage, Mega Drain, Thunderbolt, Thunder, Psychic, Mimic, Double Team, Bide, Self-Destruct, 
Dream Eater, Rest, Psy Wave, Explosion, and Substitute. Yes, I was able to read off all of those moves in one breath, because there are not very many of them. Obviously, I think that Mega Drain, Thunderbolt, and Psychic are going to see a lot of use in this playthrough, and because of my own personal playstyle, I'm sure that I'm going to find a way to fit Rest in there at some point. Now, with all of that out of the way, I am heading out of Viridian Forest, and I have done this on minimum battles. So, Haunter is going to head into the fight against Brock at only level 8. Up first is Geodude. The only move that it knows is Tackle, so it can do literally no damage to Haunter, and I can finish it off with Nightshade in only 4 turns. Now as Geodude goes down, I want to direct your attention to Haunter's current speed stat, which is 22. The Onyx on Brock's team has 23 speed, and if it moves first, this is going to be incredibly bad, because if it chooses Bide before I hit my Nightshade, it will be able to reflect some damage back. With how squishy Haunter is, I expect that if it gets two Bides in, I will probably lose. However, because of the experience that the Geodude gives, Haunter levels up, and it gets 24 speed. As a result, I can just attack first the entire time, and eventually finish the Onyx off without taking a single hit point of damage. While I finish the Onyx off, I just want to mention a weird interaction here. If it chooses Bind, it will actually play the animation, but just say it has no effect. It wastes a lot of time, and it can be very frustrating when you are trying to speedrun the game. Luckily today, Onyx does not waste my time in any way with either Bide or Bind, so I'm moving on with an incredibly fast Brock split. Now, something I want to mention about the speed of this initial Brock split is it's not much different than Gengar, because these two don't really have a way to differentiate themselves from each other. The entire line is dealing fixed damage throughout the majority of the early game, with Nightshade as its primary damage dealing move, so they're all dealing the same damage because all Pokémon in evolutionary lines have the same growth rates. By the way, I don't know if there is an exception to that rule, but I don't think that there is. The only difference that Ghastly has is that its speed stat is lower, so Brock's Onyx could be more problematic. Now I'm mentioning all of this because I really want to draw your focus to the fact that Nightshade is my go-to early move. This is so incredibly annoying. The reason is because it only has 15 PP, and when you're able to beat the early game on minimum battles, Nightshade isn't doing that much damage to each individual Pokémon. So I have to spend multiple turns knocking out weak Pokémon. Like for example, this Bug Catcher's team is very frustrating. I'm using a bit of Lick here just to conserve the PP on Nightshade, because I don't want to have to backtrack to Pewter City to have to heal. By the way, Nightshade is my only move that I can use against the normal types on this route. I guess with the exception of Confuse Ray, but like, that's really inconsistent and just awful. Honestly, this problem alone really holds this entire line back. Gengar, Haunter, and Ghastly would all be much faster if they started with a move like Confusion. In Mount Moon, I only fight one optional trainer, the guy with the Magnemite and Voltorb. He has pretty good experience yields, so I like to fight him on my first playthroughs, just so I don't go into the rest of the game severely underleveled. After that, I finish off the Super Nerd, grab myself the Dome Fossil, which of course is the proper fossil, Kabutops is far more Halloween themed. After that, I smash Jesse and James, and here I want to mention an interesting fact. I wonder if they gave the ghost type the poison typing as the secondary type, just so that it couldn't get poisoned. I was recently doing a live stream with Spiritomb, which I backported into Generation 2, and during that video I was poisoned, and that just seems really wrong on a ghost type Pokemon. Now in Cerulean City I always have to make the choice, do I fight the rival on Nugget Bridge, or do I fight Misty? In this case, I decided to go up against Misty, I figured that Nightshade would would be enough here. Star use first, and I'm able to take it down in three turns. Now because of my level, which is 19, I am just barely going to miss the three hit on Starmie. Because of this reason alone, it was probably more advisable to go to Nugget Bridge first. However, Misty could really drop the ball by just spamming things like X Defend and Harden, which have no effect on a fixed damage move like Nightshade. However, in this case, she attacks enough and Haunter does go down. So that's my first reset, and it's definitely player error. 
I thought I had gotten pretty close, so I figured I'd try again. However, in the next battle, Misty completely dominates Haunter, so it looks like the correct choice is to fight the rival on Nugget Bridge. Now you might be wondering why I chose to face Misty first, and the reason really comes down to the fact that I didn't want to go up against the rival, have Sandshrew use Sand Attack, and then run out of PP for Nightshade when I'm against a Pokemon like Rattata. In that situation, I would have to rely on Confuse Ray for damage, and the fight would likely become very long. Also, Confuse Ray is not the biggest PP move out there, so it could also just run out because of Sand Attack, and once again I could be in the same scenario. Now I hope watching this fight really illustrates my point, because by the time I make it to the Eevee, I only have four uses of Nightshade left. So, to defeat it I need three, and that leaves me with only one Nightshade. It is worth noting I went into the fight with only 12, because I defeated the Goldeen trainer in Misty's gym first. However, with one sand attack, uh, you can miss, like, infinity hits. It always feels unfair when the AI uses this move. Anyways, in this case, I defeat the rival, and now I can proceed with Nugget Bridge. I filmed this playthrough on June 19th, and I'm doing the voiceover for the video on October 11th, so a significant portion of time has passed since I did the run. And here I want to draw your attention to the fact that I fight an optional hiker here, and then move the junior trainer out of the way so that I can pick up Seismic Toss. Um, I have no idea why I am doing that. Haunter can't learn the move. So yeah, that is just some wasted time for me. Actually, it is not just some wasted time, because I am really using my PP inefficiently. Now, I don't have very much for the last at the very end of the route, so I have to save here, which on its own wastes about 5 seconds of time. And then in the battle against her, yeah, things get kinda bad, I run out of damage dealing moves, so I have to use Confuse Ray to finish off her final Oddish. By the way, there is an interesting interaction here with Confusion and Bide, any self-inflicted damage gets counted towards Bide's counter, and then paid back double when Haunter unleashes energy. This is of course something that only happens in Generation 1. At least now for Haunter, Misty is much easier. I 2 hit the Staryu, and 3 hit the Starmie, earning myself the second badge. Now I've been complaining a lot about PP throughout this run, and I'm going to continue to do that because the next trainer that I have to fight is Sandy. She has three Pidgeys, all of them no Sand Attack, and all of them are going to be two hits with Nightshade. The worst case scenario plays out because the first Pidgey lowers my accuracy, so now I have to fight with 66% accuracy for the rest of the battle. I was very worried about running out of PP here. Once again, another worst case scenario plays out because I do. So, for the final Pidgey, I have to spam Confuse Ray and get it to knock itself out. However, in first playthroughs I always pick up the Aethers along the way, so I have one from just outside of Bill's house which I can use to replenish Nightshade's PP and defeat the next trainer who has two normal types. On the SSN I pick up another Aether, which is going to actually be important because I need it to defeat the rival. I grab the TM for rest, use the Aether to defeat the gentleman so that I can get the rare candy, and here I want to review the position that I'm at going into the rival battle. I have 11 uses of Nightshade and 7 uses of Confuse Ray. With those moves, I have to defeat three normal type Pokemon. I can use Lick against the Sandshrew, but ghost moves are physical in Generation 1, and the Sandshrew's highest stat that is not its HP is its defense, so I'm not sure if that's a good idea, especially when it knows Sand Attack. Luckily for me, Nightshade 2 hits all of his first three Pokemon, so while I do arrive at the Eevee with my accuracy lowered, I do have five uses of Nightshade. Unfortunately though, the first two miss. The third one hits, doing just under half damage, because the Eevee has 55 health and I am level 27. So that means that even if I hit one more Nightshade, the Eevee will be left at one hit point. I need to hit both of my Nightshades. But the first one misses, and the second one hits, so Eevee is frustratingly left with one HP, and I have to knock it out with Confuse Ray. Luckily, I have 7 PP left over with it, so I do manage to pull this off, and with that I have finished the SSN. Now here I have a little bit of a predicament, which is I want to face Surge without healing in the Vermilion City Pokemon Center, because I want to be able to use Diglett's Tunnel to dig back to Cerulean City. This saves some walk time and potential encounters in the grass. However, I am completely out of Nightshade, so if I want to defeat him, I'm going to have to use Confuse Ray, Bide, and Lick. Well, he is one of the worst gym leaders in Generation 1, so let's see how it goes. Haunter's fast, so it outspeeds Raichu and immediately confuses it. 
Surge uses an X speed, Raichu hits itself, and then my Lick paralyzes it, so now once again I am faster. From here I continue doing chip damage with Lick while it misses moves and hits itself, but then once I get it to red health it hits Thunderbolt and does so much damage. That's because it got a critical hit. But Haunter survives, and I pull through, earning myself the third badge, and with it, a boost to my defense stat. However, that is not the real prize that Haunter earns from this battle. I now get access to Thunderbolt, which I'm going to teach to Haunter in the place of Bide. At long last, I'm not going to have any more PP problems, and I'm going to be able to utilize Haunter's best stat. It is kind of annoying though that the first special move that I get is an electric type move, because then against the Wrapping Lass, she can paralyze Haunter. Like, she's not going to knock me out because she has Absorb and Wrap, but in this case, remember the glitch that I talked about with Brock's Onyx, where it'll play the animation for Bind and just waste your time? Yeah, that can happen here. So when Bellsprout chooses to use Wrap, it just shakes my screen and wastes my time, and eventually I'll be able to attack and finish her off. But overall, this fight is just a frustrating experience for a ghost type when it shouldn't really be a problem. In Rock Tunnel, the first Pokemaniac is by far the most intimidating trainer. He has a Cubone which knows Bone Club, and a Slowpoke that has Confusion, both which are super effective against Haunter. Nightshade takes care of the Cubone in two hits, luckily it misses one Bone Club, and the first one did about a third. What if it had crit me? This could have been a reset. After that I get enough experience to level up and earn Haunter's first level up move, Hypnosis. In this case, I have to be careful which move I teach it over. I need to keep Nightshade on my learn set so that I can use it against the self-destructing hiker later on in the tunnel. So I teach Hypnosis in the place of Confuse Ray. From there, the self-destructing hiker is completely free, and I make my way into Celadon City. Now because ghost types are so good, I am going to completely skip the hideout to save time. In the department store, of course I buy myself Calcium to boost my special stat, I have to grab a Doduo because I did not find a Pidgey in Viridian Forest, and then after grabbing Fly I head to Saffron City. And here we get another major moveset update, I can learn Psychic in the place of Lick. By the way, Lick is just useless in Generation 1, I don't know if you know this, but ghost type moves cannot deal damage to Psychic type Pokemon due to a glitch. This leaves Psychic Pokemon as the most dominant type in the game, because they only have one weakness which is to bug types. And yeah, there are not a lot of good bug types, or a lot of good bug type moves. I'm gonna keep Nightshade for now, but like I'm really not gonna be using it now that I have the combo of Thunderbolt and Psychic. Despite Haunter's general color and aesthetic, Thunderbolt is going to be the better go-to move because it has 5 more base power when compared with Psychic. However, Psychic is going to be better for most of the Pokémon in the mid-game because there are so many poison and fighting types. However, I am going to wait to take advantage of this type effectiveness because I'm going to skip all of the optional trainers in Erika's gym, fight only the mandatory trainer with Execute, and then battle Erika herself. Due to Haunter's typing, there really isn't much to worry about in this battle. There is the chance that she puts me to sleep with Sleep Powder from either the Weeping Bell or the Gloom, however I have super effective damage against both of them in the form of Psychic. The Gloom survives a single hit on red health, but it just goes for Petal Dance, doing almost nothing, and I finish it off. So that fight was really easy, and the rest of the mid game is going to be similar for Haunter. Access to Psychic in combination with Thunderbolt makes everyone in Pokemon Tower trivial, I don't fight any trainers on Cycling Road, collect all the vitamins in the Safari Zone, and then I head to Silphco. Here I am going to fight one technically optional trainer, the guy with Machoke, but in my playthroughs I don't really consider him optional, I pretty much fight him with every single Pokemon. The only other trainer I fight here is the mandatory trainer who has one Arbok. This brings Haunter up to exactly level 35, and normally I want to go into the rival battle around level 40 with most Pokemon. So I'll use 5 Rare Candies to boost Haunter to level 40, I also teach it Mega Drain in the place of Nightshade, and now I'm ready to take on the rival. Unfortunately for me, this fight starts off bad, I have to 2 hit the Sand Slash with Mega Drain. Because of Psychic's effective power, it wouldn't have 1 hit, so either way the Sand Slash was going to get a turn to move, and in this case it uses Sand Attack, lowering my accuracy right away. However, Cloyster's next, and Thunderbolt easily finishes it off. Then against Magneton, I have to knock it out with 3 Psychics, which in a miracle event all hit, so I have not missed once because of Sand Attack. That is quite rare. 
Now the Fallen Cadaver is probably the scariest Pokemon on his team because it has super effective damage against Haunter. Gosh, the type matchups in this game are so weird, like I am supposed to be strong against this thing. Anyways, Thunderbolt takes it to half, it uses Psybeam, which does so much, but Haunter survives on orange health and finishes it off. Last is Flareon. I'm actually a little bit worried here because I have so little health left over. Thunderbolt doesn't do half. Flareon luckily misses Fire Spin. Okay, that's good. I hit another Thunderbolt, taking it down to orange health. It strikes back with Ember, crits, and Haunter survives with one hit point. I cannot believe it. Okay, please, Sand Attack, do not mess me up. Thunderbolt hits, and Flareon goes down. Alright, so that was pretty close. I'm surprised I didn't miss because of Sand Attack. I got extremely lucky in that battle. That is, after getting very unlucky at the start of the fight. With Sylph out of the way, the thing that makes the most sense to do next is to fight Koga for access to Surf. This fight is essentially kill or be killed. If Haunter is able to one hit with Psychic, then it won't take any damage, but if it does take damage, it's gonna be super effective in the form of Psychic. Plus, this move has a 33% chance to lower special, and that would be devastating. Haunter has enough damage to one-hit all of the Venonats and move on to the Venomoth without taking any damage. Psychic does more than half, Venomoth uses its own, and Haunter gets a special drop. Okay, so I'm really lucky that I did more than half with my first hit, but I still don't think I'm going to knock out the Venomoth. However, at the key moment, Haunter gets a crit, so Koga is defeated. With that, I get a speed boost, so now I'm basically faster than everything. Next, I backtrack to Saffron City, grab the TM for Mimic, and then fought Sabrina. Honestly, I figured that Hypnosis could just solve her team. And yeah, in this case, I was right. Her AI is so bad that she chooses terrible moves all the time, so even if you miss a few times, it's usually fine. Following her is Blaine, and in yellow version, he's actually quite good. However, Psychic is a strong move against his team because if it lowers special, then his fire type moves will deal less damage. I take the Ninetales down without taking any damage. Rapidash is next. It is by far the Pokemon on his team that is the least intimidating. Its only fire type move is Fire Spin. I guess it's scary if you're very weak to physical moves, or if getting hit by a Growl is unacceptable. However, in this case, I just don't care and finish it off, so I have full health left over for his ace. It's pretty tanky, so I decided to put it to sleep to give it less chances to roll for powerful moves like Fire Blast, and that exposes me to the risk of using Hypnosis. I miss twice, and Arcanine chooses Fire Blast twice, but Haunter survives on three hit points, hits Hypnosis, Arcanine goes to sleep, and with that, I finish it off. I'm uh, sure some of you are going to comment about that and be like, Scott, don't use hypnosis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know. So I've just flown back to Viridian City, and now I'm going to let the footage play for a little bit, because I want to talk about Giovanni in Pokemon Yellow. Here's his team in red and blue. I want you to specifically look for ground-type moves. Uh, yeah, the only two are Dig and Fissure, and the Rhydon is certainly not hitting the latter move, so that leaves Doug Trio just to hit Dig, and the Doug Trio isn't even his lead in red and blue, plus it's at a much lower level. That means that speed isn't really an issue in those games, but none of this is the case in Pokemon Yellow. Here is his teams in this game. Four of his Pokemon now know Earthquake. All of them are at higher levels. The Nidos have coverage moves like Thunder and Double Kick. And then the Rhydon is actually quite scary because it's five levels higher. It has Earthquake and it has Rock Slide. Now I'm going into depth on this team specifically because Haunter is a frail poison type Pokemon and abilities haven't been introduced yet so it can't counter Giovanni with Levitate. With this line, at this point, things start to get hard again. I had to make a choice if I wanted the experience from the trainers in the Viridian City Gym, and in this case I decided it was the right choice to face Giovanni now. After all, I really do think I'm going to be relying on key hypnosises here. Up first is the level 50 Doug Trio. Luckily, my Haunter just barely outspeeds it. I go for Psychic. It does more than half, but Doug Trio uses Earthquake and knocks Haunter out with a single non crit hit. I decided that since I am about to level up, I should fight one more trainer. This guy has two fighting types, so I can easily one-shot both of them, level up to 47, and then use three rare candies to go up to level 50 before facing Giovanni again. Instead of chancing things on the Doug Trio, it makes more sense to use Hypnosis and knock it out without taking any damage. Against the Persian, I can just spam Psychic and finish it off because it has no damage dealing moves that can hit Haunter. Now I was hoping that Psychic would one-hit the Nidos because it is super effective, 
However, the Needle Queen hangs on. But uh, Giovanni, in true Giovanni style, uses a guard spec. He's probably sponsored by guard spec, actually. As a result, I finish the Needle Queen off, move on to the Needle King, play safe. Uh, it is, I think, safer here to go for the Hypnosis rather than getting hit by an earthquake. I finish the Needle King off and arrive at the final Pokemon ride on. Okay, four times damage, Mega Drain. Please do enough. And it doesn't. However, Giovanni is contractually required to use a guard spec, so he does, and I finished right on off. To get through this battle with decent consistency at the fastest possible time, I am going to need to hit Hypnosis four times. Once on the Doug Trio, twice on both of the Nidos, and once on the final ride on. Obviously, there are two other approaches to this fight, level up just enough to survive an Earthquake, and or potentially get the damage ranges to one-hit his Pokémon. But that's not for now, we'll have to wait for my follow-up playthrough to discuss that. Let's move on to the rival on Route 22. The Sandslash isn't an issue yet because it doesn't know Earthquake, but the Execute can be problematic if it uses Stun Spore. Because I don't have any moves that are good against it, I wanted to avoid this by using Hypnosis, however I, uh, I miss, and it paralyzes me anyways, so <laughs> that's a bit frustrating. With my speed cut, I do have a problem because the Kadabra knows Psybeam and Psychic. However, I don't even make it there because the Magneton ends up finishing me off. In the next fight though, I get better Hypnosis luck. Execute doesn't paralyze me, I one-shot the Cloister, move on to the Magneton, which I put to sleep so that it doesn't paralyze me. This allows me to move first against the Kadabra, put it to sleep, and knock it out with three uses of Thunderbolt. All that's left is Flareon, and honestly this thing is not particularly strong. It is by far the rival's weakest ace. Both Vaporeon and Jolteon have their most powerful elemental move. Thunder and Hydro Pump, and I know those moves are risky to use because you can miss, but when the AI is using them, they always feel like they have 100% accuracy, especially when you're weak to them. Now as I enter Victory Road, I want everyone to direct their eyes towards the clock. It is possible for Haunter to clock in with a time under 50 minutes in its first playthrough. However, there is one major thing working against me right now, and that is the fact that I have used 8 rare candies to this point. I also didn't go into the hideout or the power plant, so I only have 2 remaining in my bag. As a result, I'm looking to finish with a very low level, however that could be problematic if I don't have the damage I need to finish off the final trainers. But in this case, I am banking on Hypno so, let's see how the RNG treats me in the Elite Four. For this battle I have Thunderbolt. Now I do manage to get a critical hit on the Dugong, which was my only way to knock it out. I checked that damage range in post. Cloyster, on the other hand, is a guaranteed one hit though, and that leads me to the Slowbro. In Pokemon Yellow, Lorelei has good AI, and in this case the Slowbro can choose between Psychic or Amnesia. My Thunderbolt doesn't finish it off, luckily it chooses Amnesia, and I take it down. Against Jinx, I obviously don't have any moves that are particularly good, so I use Hypnosis to put it to sleep. And then I want all of you to pay attention. I use Thunderbolt, the Jinx wakes up when it's on low health. Then Lorelei uses a Super Potion, I take it back down to low health, paralyze it, and then it isn't able to move and I knock it out. Yeah, um, if I was playing as that Jinx, I would be so frustrated. The final Pokemon on Lorelei's team is Lapras. Now, because she has good AI, she sees that Confuse Ray is super effective against my Ghost type, so she's just gonna spam this status move, even when I am confused. The AI modification number one, which is the one that checks if your Pokemon has a status condition, it only checks for non-volatile status conditions, so the ones that show up where your level is. Now Lorelei does have this AI modification, but it doesn't account for Confuse Ray, so this Pokemon is basically free. And uh, you know what else is free? The entire next trainer. So that means we have made it to Agatha, the Ghost-type Specialist. Now theoretically she should have powerful Ghost-type moves that are super effective against Haunter, but in this case she has powerful Psychic-type moves that are going to be super effective against Haunter. However, she's basically a Poison Specialist, so I'm just going to be able to sweep her team with Psychic. That is, unless the first Gengar messes me up by using Confuse Ray, and then Haunter hits itself uh, three times in a row, allowing Lick to take me down to red health. Luckily, I snap out of Confusion and finish the Gengar 
Gengar off with my second hit. Next is Golbat. Now, this thing is actually kind of tanky. I just went for Psychic because spamming A is faster when I'm playing at four times game speed. Having to change my move requires precise timing of inputs, and I usually have to slow down just a little bit. However, in this case, the missing five base power was probably the deciding factor that allowed Golbat to hang on. By the way, I checked these damage ranges in post, and Thunderbolt had a 52% chance to knock out the Haunter. While it isn't a guarantee, it's at least better than the 27% chance I had with Psychic. Unfortunately, because it survived, it confused Haunter, but I do knock it out on the next turn and move on to Agatha's Haunter. However, on the first turn in battle against it, Confusion gets the best of me, and I get a reset here. I'm not really scared though, because Agatha is pretty inconsistent, she does not have good AI. The Gengar just goes for Substitute on the first turn, allowing me to knock it out for free. I use Thunderbolt, one hitting the Golbat, make it back to the Haunter, which does get a lick in, but it luckily doesn't paralyze me. Arbok is a one-shot with Psychic, and with that I've made it to her ace, Gengar. Now this one is the scariest Pokémon for Haunter, because it has Psychic and Dream Eater, plus it knows Hypnosis, which can be really annoying, and uh, if all of that isn't enough, Confuse Ray is still frustrating. I miss Hypnosis, it confuses me. Luckily I attack on the next turn, but uh, Hypnosis misses, so it doesn't matter. Haunter hits itself, Gengar just continues spamming Confuse Ray like it's inspired by Lorelei's Lapras. And uh, my Hypnosis is just keep missing. At this point it obviously would have been just far better for me to spam Psychic. Finally though, I do put it to sleep, and finish Agatha off. Alright, so we're getting close to the 50 minute mark. If I can get through Lance and the Champion quickly, Haunter can do it. For this fight, I've taught Haunter Mimic so that it can steal Ice Beam to sweep through his final two Pokemon. Obviously, the Gyarados is a one-shot. The first Dragonair can be a little bit annoying if it paralyzes with Thunder Wave or with Thunderbolt. So I put it to sleep and then finish it off with two uses of Psychic. I knew that Psychic was not going to one-hit there. The next Dragonair can freeze you with Ice Beam, so I put it to sleep, grab Ice Beam, and knock it out. Now, Aerodactyl is the fastest Pokémon in the game when the champion does not have Jolteon. So it moves first, using Fly, and this actually does a lot of damage to Haunter. But it survives, finishes it off, and makes it to Lance's ace, Dragonite. I go for Ice Beam, and it takes it out in a single hit. Okay, that was a quick Lance fight, let's move on to the champion, I think I might be able to do this under 50 minutes. I use my final two rare candies, and head into the battle. In Pokemon Yellow, I have done a total of 9 playthroughs with Gengar. I was able to get its time under 40 minutes, and I'm pretty proud of my current results with it. That being said, getting those results was a very frustrating process. Almost exclusively because of the champion. His lead Sandslash knows Earthquake, and it will one-hit Haunter if it gets to attack. He has good AI, so he's always going to choose this move, and Psychic with a regular damage range cannot one-hit the Sandslash. It actually can't even one-hit the Sandslash sometimes when it gets a crit. As a result, I have to use Hypnosis. I need to put the Sandslash to sleep, and then finish it off by using Psychic. In this case, it does go to sleep, but it wakes up right away, and I have to re-roll Hypnosis, which luckily hits. I use Psychic, get a critical hit with a good roll, and Sandslash goes down. Okay, so that is a good start to the fight, but things do not get better for the ghost type here. Next is Alakazam, and once again, this thing is super effective against me, and it is very powerful. Luckily though, Haunter has a high special stat, so its Psychics won't knock me out unless it gets a critical hit. However, I have no moves that are super effective against it, despite being a ghost type, so I'm going to have to rely on Thunderbolt, which is going to be a 3 hit. Because of that, once again I have to use Hypnosis. Like yeah, I guess you could gamble for it using Kinesis twice in a row and missing both times. That is possible, but that doesn't seem like a solid strategy. With Alakazam asleep, I hit it with one Thunderbolt, and then it wakes up. Okay, <laughs> this is really annoying. I decided not to put it to sleep and just chance it here, and I actually get a critical hit, so it goes down on the next turn. That leads to Executor, and I have bad news. It does not get better here. While this thing cannot do direct damage to me, because it only has two normal-type moves, and it's also never going to use Leech Seed due to my poison typing. However, he knows that Hypnosis is super effective, so whenever I am awake, he is going to try to put me to sleep. What that means is I essentially have to counter his Hypnosis with my own Hypnosis. It can lead to some really silly scenarios where you both spam Hypnosis back and forth for like four turns in a row. Also, it can lead to scenarios where the Executor puts you to sleep over and over and over again, and it just wastes your time. When I am trying to clock in under 50 minutes, and the clock is rapidly approaching that mark, I do not want to have to waste time against this silly coconut pineapple thing. 
But today everything goes my way and I move on to the next Pokemon, which is also a problem for Haunter. Because of type effectiveness, Magneton is not going to use both Swift and Screech, meaning it is going to randomize between Thunderbolt and Thunder Wave. Uh, both of those are really bad, by the way. Thunder Wave being the worst by far, and Magneton in Generation 1 has a really impressive special stat. Right now, it is 161. That is like fairly close to the champion's Alakazam, which I always find surprising. As a result, my uses of Psychic are going to take three turns to knock the Magneton out. I knew this because I've played a lot of Gengar, so I'm going for Hypnosis here to try to put the Magneton to sleep. But it uses Thunder Wave, which by the way has 100% accuracy. The AI does not have a debuff on that in Generation 1. So I'm slow, and I have a status condition, so the only thing it can do now is use Thunderbolt. It crits right away, taking Haunter to red health. Hypnosis misses, and that's a reset. And it's an unfortunate one, because now I am not going to clock in under 50 minutes. The next fight goes how I was expecting things to go. I miss Hypnosis, Sandslash uses Earthquake, and I get a reset. And how do you think the third fight goes? I miss Hypnosis, Sandslash uses Earthquake, and I get another reset. I honestly hate this Pokemon. It seems like the developers put it here just to make you frustrated by the fact that Pikachu is your starter. That design choice in a children's game alone is like prison worthy. Ah, it's awful. Anyways, in the next fight, I put it to sleep, but it, it wakes up right away. Of course it does. I put it back to sleep, and this time I play slightly differently. Instead, I mimic Earthquake so that I can use this against the Magneton. By the way, this will give me a two hit against it rather than a three hit. Now we're just going to jump ahead in the fight to the Executor, because here I miss my Hypnosis and it puts me to sleep. And uh, check this out, it just goes for Barrage, does nothing, I wake up, I go for Hypnosis, and now I put it to sleep. Okay, so let's finish it off and move on to the Magneton. Here I hit Hypnosis, use two Earthquakes, and take it down. Alright, so I'm moving on to the Cloister. With Gengar, I have a guaranteed one hit here with Thunderbolt, but because Haunter has lower stats, the Cloister just barely survives and uses Ice Beam. If it freezes, I lose. But it doesn't. I hit another Thunderbolt and finish it off. And with that, I have finished the game. The Flareon, by the way, knows Reflect, so it is just going to spam that against me, once again cementing the fact that it is by far the rival's worst evolution. So with it out of the way, Haunter clocks in with a first playthrough result of 51 minutes and 39 seconds, with 8 resets at level 59. This was a game time of 3 hours and 10 minutes. At this point, I'm going to make some comparisons that aren't really fair. I do think it's useful for you to see, though, so that at the end, when I go through these statistics again, we can see how much I improved my subsequent playthroughs. This bar graph maps Gengar's final playthrough time against Haunter's first playthrough time. As I'm sure you can all see, there is very little difference in the Brock split. My Misty split took a lot longer with Haunter, primarily because of my mistake trying to fight her first. After that, I think I had some inefficiencies during my Surge split, which probably can be leveled out in my second Haunter playthrough, and then I had a lot more time accumulate during the Rival 5 split. From there throughout the rest of the mid game, things are fairly even between these two runs. Like if I showed you just the run starting from Sabrina, you would probably think these are the same Pokemon, just with different RNG. And that's really what it comes down to, because if you look at the champion for Haunter, it had much more time, largely because of awful RNG, because the champion's team is very challenging. But these two playthroughs are really not much different. The game time by trainer graph shows that. Uh, there's some weird downward slopes there. That's just because I did things in a different order with Gengar. That is probably the more optimal order, so I should implement that with Haunter. However, after that, you can see that these times basically become lockstep until the very end of the game. I also think that this graph is very interesting. This is level by trainer. And you can see here that these two are almost at the exact same level throughout the entire playthrough. Obviously, having a fantastic type, a good special and speed stat, and access to moves like Thunderbolt and Psychic do help, but the thing that really allows this to happen is the move Hypnosis. It, in combination with the high speed stat, can solve pretty much any problem that a Pokemon has, meaning that for them, they just don't need to do extra training. If you don't believe me on this, just look at this graph. This is Haunter against Gengar against Hypno against Victory Bell, and this is Levels by Trainer, and you can see that all of them end up at like basically the same level, with Victory Bell being one level higher. However, if I went back and redid that run, I'm sure I could just remove that level. 
Obviously though, not everything is equal between these Pokemon because some do make it through the game much faster. So I'm going to announce here that there is a slight spoiler for something that might come up in the future on the channel, but only might if I have enough time. I have done more runs with Hypno and Victory Bell since the final runs that I have done produced videos on for the channel. And I'm going to show those results now. So this is a real time by trainer graphic. And you can see here that Victory Bell is significantly faster than both Gengar and Hypno who were around the same time. And then at this point, Haunter is lagging significantly behind those three. By the way, the Victory Bell time that I got was a 36 minute time. It is so far the fastest Pokemon Yellow time I have, and uh, I don't see that changing in the future when I repeat all of these Pokemon and try and push their results lower. So that is what Haunter is up against. Let's see what I can do in another playthrough. I don't want to spend too much time on the early game, I just want to mention one small fact. I play all my runs with perfect DVs to ensure that I have good comparisons between all the Pokemon. This does of course bias the results towards each species these best performance. However, that is what I am really looking for. I'm not looking for the worst possible performance for each Pokemon. Of course, you could just like Gen 1 miss all over the place and get hit by Sand Attack and have terrible results. I'm looking for each Pokemon at their peak form. However, this does emit some nuance that I want to go into right now. So for example, if I didn't have a perfect Haunter, there is a chance that I speed tie the Onix or underspeed the Onix after leveling up on minimum battles. I calculated all of this for you so you don't have to go and look it up. If I had 9 or less speed, I speed tie the onyx, and if I had 3 or less speed, I would under speed the onyx. So it's pretty unlikely that onyx is going to move first. And it's a little bit better than a 1 in 3 chance that Haunter is going to move first. So overall against Brock, I really like Haunter's odds even if it isn't a perfect Pokemon. Obviously the change I make in the next section of the game is just to fight Misty after Nugget Bridge. It still can result in a loss, but in this case it doesn't, so Haunter's moving on, reset free. Now in the next section of the game I actually get some really bad luck. Remember the Pokemaniac that I mentioned that could be a problem for Haunter? Yeah, he is a problem in this run. So as I said before, the Cubone knows Bone Club and the Slowpoke knows Confusion. In this case, I was trying to use Confuse Ray to prevent the Cubone from using Bone Club, and then use three Nightshades to knock it out. However, that doesn't work out for me, and it finishes Haunter off. In the next battle I decided to attack right away instead of trying to confuse it, but it doesn't matter, the Cubone just crits with Bone Club and Haunter goes down anyways. Honestly, this was pretty unlucky and it's frustrating having two resets this early on. However, that is a problem that Haunter has if it's not going to do more training earlier on in the game. By the way, the Pokemaniac trainer class does have good AI, so this Cubone is only going to use Bone Club. That was a fact that I wasn't aware of when I was doing this second Haunter playthrough, so objectively the correct strategy strategy here is to just spam Nightshade, knock the Cubone out surviving with a little bit of health, and then one-shot the Slowpoke with Thunderbolt. And now, with that frustrating trainer out of the way, let's talk about some of the small things I changed in the mid-game. In Erica's gym, I fight two trainers. By the way, this cool trainer has amazing experience yields. She is basically going to become my go-to trainer if I want to do minimum battles. This gives me the exact experience that I need to be level 35 without wasting experience. Then I can use Rare Candies to take Haunter up to level 42. That gives me two more levels against the Rival in Sylph, which is always nice. And with that, I can move on to the next sections of the game. First of all, we have Koga. By the way, the Venomoth only has a 3% chance to one-hit Haunter, so this fight is very consistent because I will be two-hitting. After that, I crush Blaine with no resets and move on to Sabrina. This has to be the most annoying fight for a ghost type in Pokemon Yellow. The best move I have against her is Thunderbolt. Now, I should mention here that Gengar does have access to Body Slam, which is physical, and that is a lot better against Sabrina, whereas both Haunter and Ghastly are stuck with Thunderbolt. I don't know why Gengar gets Body Slam, like, it does have feet, but it doesn't really have a body, it's mostly just a head. It's also supposed to be, like, made out of gas and, like, ghost stuff, I don't know, ectoplasm. How does that Body Slam things? People always tell me in the comments body slam is like picking the person up and like slamming them down on the ground but then any pokemon that has hands should be able to learn it and pokemon that don't have hands like rhyhorn should not be able to learn it anyways i don't know why gengar can learn it it would be nice if haunter could too and i think if it did it might smooth this section of the game out unfortunately for me i get two more resets here the strategy I came up with though is pretty simple. I have to use Hypnosis on the Abra because I have to 3 hit it with Thunderbolt. If I miss and the Abra successfully lands a flash, I'm just going to reset right away so that I don't waste extra time. I defeat Sabrina on my third attempt and with that I'm ready to take on Giovanni. 
Now for this fight, I do need to mention something. In the older days on this channel, I allowed Pokemon to use Double Team and Minimize if they learned them by level up. I want to take some time to go through my thought process around this because I get asked a lot about it in the comments. First of all, people say, why no Double Team when you're allowed to use something like Sand Attack? Well, for example, on Giovanni's team, if I wanted to use Sand Attack, I would have to use it six times on each one of his Pokemon. That means each one of his Pokemon has chances to hit me while I get set up, and then once I'm finally set up, if I knock the Pokemon out, I have to re-establish Sand Attack if I want to continue dodging hits. With Double Team, it is completely different. You just set it up once, then it's there for the rest of the battle for your solo Pokemon, and you sweep their team. Additionally, when you set up Double Team, it badge boosts all of your other stats. That is, if you have the Boulder, Thunder, Volcano, and Soul badges. So at the beginning of 2023, I was thinking about doing a bunch of runs with like Scyther and Staryu and Pokemon like that, and then I realized that all of those runs are going to be pretty boring for me to play and for you to watch if I'm able to use evasion boosting moves, so I decided to ban them outright with one exception. I am allowed to use Mimic to steal double team only in the battle here against Giovanni. The reason I have allowed this is because without this tactic, fire types and electric types basically don't have a way to get by him without completely tanking their results in the tier list. It is of course fair criticism saying that this biases the results towards fire and electric types, maybe they should just all be ranked much lower. Because I am obsessed with Pokemon Yellow, I am sure I will eventually do runs where I do not allow myself to use double team with fire and electric types, but for now I'm going to keep this strategy in as a viable alternative for Giovanni. And of course today, for this poison type, it is relevant, so that's how I defeat him here. Now, as I head out to face the rival on Route 22, I want to slow things down a little bit, because I want to talk about a development that's been happening behind the scenes. I have a public Discord, which is for solo challenge runs. Basically, if you want to play the game with my overlay, that sort of thing, you can join the Discord, and you can get everything set up, and then do these challenges yourself. In there, I have started challenging people from the community to run the Pokemon that I will be running in coming weeks. The first Pokemon that I did this with was Haunter. Now, the reason I wanted to do this is because it has always been my goal to bring people together, to harness the power of mass data, to come up with the best strategies for every single Pokemon. I'm mentioning this now because it is going to become increasingly relevant as we get into the league. And to set that up, I need to talk about the Rivals team first. I've been complaining a lot in like all of my videos about the Magneton, and yeah, I am going to continue to complain about it. I'm sure that some of you are like, why not just face the Jolteon team to make everything easier? Well, in the case of Haunter, Gengar, and Ghastly, it doesn't make sense to go to Route 22 and defeat the rival there. His Spearow knows Peck, so you can actually lose that early into the game, plus the time spent there isn't really worth it. Everyone who did solo Haunter challenges also faced the Flareon team, and this is also a good idea because once you make it to the Cloister and then the Flareon, things just get easier and easier. It is always better to reset earlier into the fight than later into the fight. Alright, so with that explanation out of the way, let's go into the league. I want to talk about a couple small optimizations here. Against Agatha, I steal Substitute, just to give me a little bit more resistance to Confuse Ray tactics. They can get very annoying. Other than that, I'm just going to spam Psychic and defeat her. Against Lance, things get pretty close because I'm underleveled, and the Aerodactyl actually takes me down to red health. However, because of high special, Haunter still is able to defeat him. So, that brings Haunter to the champion, and it brings me, and a whole bunch of other people, to the Discord, because the discussion about Haunter's rooting was basically exclusively about this one battle. Everything else in the entire run with this line is fairly straightforward. And then you get here, and it just becomes really awful. Austin was kind enough to remind everyone that Flareon just spams Reflect, so we don't need to worry about that Pokemon. At my current level, I have a 48% chance to knock out the Cloister in a single hit, but it's really not that scary, and it's unlikely that it will freeze me with Ice Beam. After all, it could choose other moves like Clamp or Aurora Beam instead. As people started clocking in, I was noticing that most of the results for Haunter were under 55 minutes. So in his first playthrough, Austin got a time of 52 minutes and 54 seconds. Zelda fan refined his approach and got the time down to 49 minutes and 56 seconds. And then Ike the Killer, as he is known to do, came in and set a new record with his first playthrough of 49 minutes and 8 seconds. This is when discussion got intense about the champion, and we really wanted to dial in exactly how many hypnosises we needed to use. 
Ike had some critical insight here which really impacted the final playthrough that I did. His contribution was that if you mimic Slash from the Sand Slash at the beginning of the fight, which you have to put to sleep with Hypnosis anyways, then you can use this move in combination with Haunter's high base speed to get guaranteed crits. This ensures higher physical damage against the Alakazam, so you will always two hit it. The reason this is so important is that then you can just tank one hit from Alakazam and not have to put it to sleep. That means that you only need one Hypnosis to get to the Executor, which is so much more consistent. Now if you miss on the Executor with Hypnosis, it doesn't matter, you just waste time, which is frustrating, but you're not going to lose the fight. Also, it's obviously better to have Slash against the Executor than Earthquake. However, once you make it to the Magneton, everything changes, and this is where we decided we needed our second use of Hypnosis. Put the Magneton to sleep, knock it out with three uses of Psychic, move on to the Cloister, hope you get the one hit and it doesn't freeze and then finish off the Flareon consistently. Using this strategy that we all worked on together, I end up with a final time of 43 minutes and 44 seconds with 8 resets at level 59. This took 2 hours and 42 minutes of game time. Alright, so now let's do analysis between Gengar's final result and Haunter's final result. Notably, I had to play Gengar 9 times to figure the route out. I only had to play Haunter 3 times. I do not think that this is an indication of intuitiveness. I basically just used the knowledge that I collected playing Gengar and used it with Haunter to get a better result faster. So if we look at the bar graph of the splits, we can see that the differences in the playthroughs start to show around Lieutenant Surge. This makes a lot of sense because that's when Gengar picks up Body Slam. For Haunter, it has to continue relying on Nightshade, which is just so frustrating. And then the reason my Erika split is a little bit bloated is because I had those resets against the Pokemaniac. From there, everything is fairly similar in the rest of the game, with the champion taking longer with Haunter, because even in my final playthrough, I had a lot of bad RNG. If we want to remove some of the RNG, we can look at the game time results from these two, and uh, you'll notice that they are very close together, and then at Lieutenant Surge, the times start diverging just a little bit. This is because Gengar is one-shotting more Pokémon, whereas Haunter is having to take multiple turns to knock out each enemy. That small difference in times maintains until much later in the playthrough, where it widens just a little bit more. I think that that is largely a result of the fact that Haunter is not getting as good damage ranges when compared to Gengar, just because of its base stats. So now let's talk about the tier list. Today, Haunter earns itself an impressive spot at the end of the S tier, and I do want to mention that I have done two other full videos on middle stage Pokemon, Gloom and Pidgeotto. Currently Gloom is in the D tier, and Pidgeotto is in the F tier. A long time ago I also did a run with Dragonair, and uh, it's not going to rank very well either when I redo it. Honestly, out of all the mid-stage Pokemon, who could possibly compete with Haunter? Well, uh, I'll leave that up to all of you to figure out. So, that's it for this video. Thank you so much if you support me on Patreon or through YouTube memberships. It means the world to me. Thank you so much to Mantasleep for sponsoring this video. And now, if you made it this far, you're incredible. I'll see you in my next video. Or you will stick around and watch me face Professor Oak. By the way, I had to tell my video editor, Sean, to remind me every time I forget to do this fight, because it happens way too often. I initially forgot to record this footage, so I did go back and do it later on. Now, the reason I usually forget Professor Oak is that this battle is not really that challenging, and it is a complete breeze for Haunter. Tauros only has normal type moves, so it can't do any damage to Haunter. Then the Executor is the exact same situation as the Champion's Executor, so it could waste some time with Hypnosis. Once it is out of the way, I have to face the first Pokémon that can deal direct damage to Haunter, and it's Arcanine, but of course, it only has moves that are assigned through level up, so its best move, the only one that can hit me, is Ember. I think that the worst thing that could happen to me right here is the Arcanine could burn me, and then the burn damage could slowly wear Haunter down. However, that doesn't happen, so I move on to the Venusaur. Now it could put me to sleep and then knock me out with Razor Leaf, so this is probably the first realistic loss condition in the battle. However, I have super effective damage in the form of Psychic, so I'm able to take it out and move on to his final Pokémon. The highest level Pokémon that is assigned to any trainer team, it is Gyarados. But unfortunately for it, I have Thunderbolt, so Haunter knocks it out in a single hit, and with that, it has defeated Oak. Alright, for real now, see you next time.